Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. This is going to be likely a two-parter on CT of the oncology patient with an acute abdomen, a pattern approach. And this is based on an article or a series of articles we published in Emergency Radiology literally this past month. And, you know, CT is the key study in the acute abdomen. And we look at these cases 24-7, 365. Acute abdominal complaints constitute up to 40% of ED presentations in oncology patients. And so when you're thinking about oncology patients, you need to think about all the reasons for the acute abdomen that occur in normal patients, appendicitis, diverticulitis, ischemic bowel, bowel obstruction, adhesions. But then you got to think about the oncology patient where they're on chemotherapy or radiation therapy or had surgery. Their weakened immune system, often due to different therapies, make them susceptible to infection. So you're thinking about everything that's classic in the acute abdomen, but things that are more unique to that specific patient. So you need to know that the patient have surgery, so then bowel obstruction could be adhesions. You always worry, of course, bowel obstruction can be due to recurrent tumor. We also need to use both axial and multiplanar and 3D imaging to really optimize our visualization. And this article in Emergency Radiology, which is in press, so you can look at it online now, but it's two parts, okay? So if you look at the first part, we talk about some of the basics and we talk about the challenges in the ER patient. Again, in oncology patients, 40% of ED presentations are the acute abdomen. And again, the range of possibilities is extensive. What CT helps us do is narrow down the differential and often make the specific finding, whether the patient simply needs observation or discharge or even emergency surgery. Again, complications with bowel can lead to sepsis, shock, and even organ failure. In the uh, oncology patient, the acute abdomen, we talk about infectious and ischemic and other factors. We talk about the increased incidence of GI bleeding. CT is the study of choice to look for GI bleeding, but in a regular population, perhaps it's most common due to a uh, diverticulum or maybe a AV malformation, while in the oncology patient, it could be due to the primary tumor or related to the patient's therapy. Now, when we talk about small bowel obstruction, we talk about the fact that patients often will have tumors, be they adenocarcinoma, carcinoids, or just tumors. So primary tumors to bowel can recur or cause symptoms. Also metastasis, whether it's melanoma or breast or colorectal or ovarian cancer. Small bowel obstruction due to malignancy accounts to, for up to 10% of all cases being the third leading cause of small bowel obstruction after adhesions and hernia. And here's a nice example, 70 year old, a female presenting to the ED with abdominal pain. You can see dilated small bowel with a transition near the ileocecal region. And if you look carefully, there's a mass there. This was a colon carcinoma. So sometimes the initial presentation of the oncology patient is in the ER setting. In this case, bowel obstruction, we considered all of the possibilities. We looked for the transition point, and the transition point nicely showed us the patient's primary tumor. Or in this case, the patient had a history of colon cancer with a right hemicolectomy a year earlier, and now has abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. So you're worried, could this be adhesions? Could it be recurrent tumor? Could it be appendicitis? Could it be many possibilities? What this was, was tumor recurrence at the site of the prior adenocarcinoma. And again, you can see it very nicely on the reconstructed images. Again, we have lectures that go into detail about small bowel obstruction and looking for transition points. And this is a very nice example 
or in this case, a patient with several weeks of abdominal pain. The patient has a markedly dilated appendix, which is also causing some dilated small bowel. And this was not just appendicitis, because appendix is really large. This was a signet cell adenocarcinoma of the appendix proper. Now, bowel perforation is a life-threatening emergency. It can be due to perforation of ulcer. It can be due to trauma. It can be due to tumor. In the oncology patient, it can result from the tumor growing and being necrotic or the response of the tumor to the patient's chemotherapy. Sometimes the chemotherapy is working really well, but it can lead to necrosis and perforation. Patients can be immunosuppressed, and then tiflitis can result in perforation around the cecum. Bowel perforation is more common in patients with lymphoma, especially in those receiving chemotherapy, and in stromal tumors of the small bowel. A review of lymphoma reported a 9% GI perforation rate, with 59% of the cases occurring in the small bowel. Now we talk about intersusception. Now intersusceptions can be due to lipomas, benign polyps, but they also can be due to malignancies. We talk about melanoma as a leading cause of intersusceptions, but literally almost any tumor from a cyst to an adenocarcinoma or metastasis, particularly polypoid type metastasis, can lead to intersusceptions. We talk about volvulus, which is the twisting of a segment of small bowel around this mesenteric axis. This is often and most commonly probably due to adhesions, but it can be due to bands, but it also can be due to tumors. Cancer patients may be at increased risk for secondary small bowel volvulus due to adhesions from prior surgery, tumor masses, or treatment-induced changes in bowel motility. Due to high risk of bowel necrosis, early diagnosis and prompt surgical intervention are indeed going to be critical. We talk about oncology patients undergoing chemotherapy. They're susceptible to thromboembolic events, which means not only the pulmonary arteries and peripheral vessels, but also the SMA, also the SMV. Venous thrombosis is more common than arterial. Occasionally large tumors can obstruct the vessels due to mass effect. In rare instances, mesenteric ischemia can be the presenting symptom that leads to the diagnosis of the patient's malignancy. So again, there's a number of different possibilities which indeed can happen and things you need to be aware of. Due to the increased immunity and the toxic effects of various treatment modalities, oncology patients are susceptible to infection. Now, we talk about the different infections that can occur, but bacterial and viral agents are commonly involved. We talk about um, the varying enterocolitis. We talk about ischemic colitis. We talk about reactions to chemotherapy. We talk about reactions to radiation therapy from obstruction and adhesions to perforation are all things that we need to worry about. Here's a patient with relapsed T-cell acute lymphoblastic lymphoma with abdominal pain and neutropenic fever. The patient's findings were consistent with tiflitis with bowel perforation. Bowel perforation can be a difficult diagnosis because particularly patients have poor tissue planes. There may be tumor present, so it can be a very challenging diagnosis. Here's a patient with an orthotopic heart transplant who is on immunosuppressive therapy. The patient developed B-cell lymphoma. You can see the liver and splenic lesions as well as extensive adenopathy. And you can see the extent of tumor and concern for perforation. In this patient with prostate cancer and melanoma, the patient has an intersusception nicely shown on the axial and coronal and on the cinematic rendering. All of it very, very nicely shown 
in this series of images. And again, you want to be very careful. If you have one finding, you want to keep looking because it's possible patient has multiple metastasis or can have a combination of problems that indeed can be challenging to you. Here's another example of a patient with left hemicolectomy for colon cancer and now abdominal pain. The patient has obstruction. You can see in the left side of the abdomen mass effect. You would really worry about the possibility of internal hernia, possible recurrent tumor, and there was a tight band present, and that's what led to the volvulus. The bowel was hemorrhagic, but because it was caught early enough, the bowel was viable, and the patient and the bowel were able to survive. Here's a patient with a carcinoid tumor with desmoplastic reaction. You can see the thickening of the bowel, and carcinoid tumors can lead to ischemic bowel because of this desmoplastic reaction. Now, I mentioned infection. Bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic are all possibilities and more frequent in patients who are immunosuppressed. We talk about the range of fungal infection. We think about fungal infection more commonly in liver and spleen. We think about it more commonly in the lung, but it can involve bowel. We talk about parasitic infections, again, because the patient is immunocompromised. Now, in terms of appearances, sometimes the appearance is suggestive where Giardia is located versus CMV can be helpful at times, but not always. Here's a patient with myeloma with CART T therapy. The patient has dilated small bowel from the ligament of trites with a demodus small bowel loops present. And this was infectious etiology, really inflamed bowel. You could think about ischemia, you could think about enteritis. This patient had blood cultures positive for Klebsiella, and that was the cause of the abnormal bowel with disseminated infection. Here's a patient with colon cancer and right hemicolectomy. You can see a large mass present. You can see that the patient has necrotic tumor as well as tumor implants. One of the things, again, to think about, I mentioned infection, I mentioned adhesions post-surgery, and of course, tumor recurrence is often something you need to think about. Now, I mentioned um, we also have two parts to this article. One of the key findings we speak about in part two, we talk about some of the newer complications. We talk about treatment modification and how that can lead to all sorts of problems. But again, careful follow-up of the patients is necessary. And again, the entire process of looking at the patient's bowel. So what do we think about? Oncology patients undergo abdominal surgeries for a section, medicine management of tumor-related complications, intraperitoneal adhesions can develop. Peritoneal adhesions are the underlying cause in up to 75% of small bowel obstruction with significant variation in the time between initial surgery and the first recurrence of obstruction. We always think about uh, obstruction being years after surgery, but it can be as early as a week or so. The average is somewhere between 3.7 and 8.9 years. Another surgical complication is anastomotic leak. Again, you talk about that commonly with Whipple's procedure, but any colon resection, any bowel resection, you always have to worry about this complication. It can present with small bowel obstruction. It can present with fever. It can present with the appearance of obstruction. We talk about hemopoietic stem cell transplants and graft-versus-host disease, where the donor in Immunocompetent T cells attack the host tissues, commonly the GI tract, skin, uh, liver, and lungs. Acute graft versus host disease is within 100 days post transplant, and chronic graft versus host is after 100 days. One of the things about graft versus host disease, it's one of the most impressive kind of spaghetti look appearance. 
the good news in oncology is because of new chemotherapy agents, we're able to minimize or eliminate graft-versus-host disease, which was super common previously, but it's significantly less common. Now, here's an example of graft-versus-host disease, but let's do this. Let's take a few minute break. Let's come back and do part two, picking up with our discussion of graft-versus-host disease, and then looking at a range of other processes that involve the bowel. See you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.